In this problem, we're given a wave with uh, this formula I've typed up above here, and we are assuming that this formula for the wave follows the same pattern as the standard wave formula that we typically have, as I wrote down below here. Now this problem asks us a variety of questions about the wave, so let's tackle each of them one by one. A part A of the problem asks us to determine the amplitude of the equation. And this part is probably the easiest, because the amplitude is uh, considered y sub m. That is the standard variable for the amplitude. So as long as you have the formula that the problem gives us, and the, uh, the standard skeleton, if you will, of, the, of the, the wave equation, you can pretty easily see what this is going to be. And also, you should know anyway, but because a sinusoidal function can only oscillate between negative 1 and 1, the amplitude is obviously going to be whatever constant is outside of that sinusoidal function, multiplying it by whatever factor uh, it could be the highest point that that wave will end up being at. So it's pretty clear here that the amplitude of this wave is just going to be 6.0. And, uh, of course, we have to include a unit. And one thing the problem also specifies is that this uh, wave formula here is uh, in centimeters. So that means our amplitude is going to be 6.0 centimeters. All right, now that's part A. Let's move on to part B now, which asks us to determine the wavelength of uh, the transverse wave. Now, we'll need to come up with some formula for the wavelength that relates uh, the variables that we can discern, that we can determine, from the formula up above. It's not going to be as easy as part A, because we'll actually have to do a calculation or two for this part. Now, what we can know from this formula, uh, based on the, the wave formula alone, is we have the amplitude, which we determined already and we can get from reading off here. But we can also get the angular wave number, uh, the constant with the, associated with the little k here. And we can also get the angular frequency, which is going to be the constant associated with the t on the right side of the phase. Now we have a formula for the angular wave number, k. And it's given by uh, k, where k is equal to um, 2 pi divided by the wavelength. And so what this does is it tells us a formula for the wavelength, which is represented by the lambda here, uh, that is that is, includes the k. There's a relationship between the angular wave number and the wavelength. So let's rewrite this formula. Let's uh, multiply both sides by the wavelength here. Uh, so we have can put the wavelength on the other side. And these are going to cancel out, of course. And then we'll divide k by both sides. So what the result is that we have a formula for the wavelength, which is given by 2 pi divided by uh, the angular wave number, k. Now let's plug in the values we're actually given for a k. So it's going to be 2 pi divided by k, and in our case here, k is going to be the total constant multiplied by x, by the position variable x which in this case is point, uh, zero, two, zero pi. Don't forget to include the pi. It might be easy to forget that part since it's not uh, a digit number like the other uh, number, like the other number there, the point zero, two, zero. But it's important to include the pi as well. So let's put that there and let's uh, do this multiplication. Let's do this division here. And uh, the pi's are gonna cancel out, of course. So it ends up just becoming a problem of 2 divided by 0 0.02. And this ends up being uh, 100 centimeters. That ends up being the result. But because the values we're given here are written in two uh, significant figures, we'll want to write 100 centimeters as two significant figures. So I'm actually going to put this in scientific notation. I'm going to write this as 1.0 times 10 to the power of 2 centimeters. And that is going to be uh, our wavelength for uh, 
the wave that we've been get, had given to us. Part C of the problem asks us to determine the frequency of the wave. All right. Now we have a few formulas for frequency, but the one that will actually include the values we're given here in this, by this equation is going to be the one that includes the angular frequency that we can get from this part of the part of the the wave formula. And the frequency is going to be given by, as we know, the frequency is going to be the angular weight, uh, the angular frequency, or the omega, the curly w there, uh, divided by two pi. All right. Now, what is what is the angular frequency going to be? The angular frequency is the constant associated with the t, the constant multiplying the time variable, which is 4.0 times pi. Once again, don't forget to include the pi. So that's going to be 4.0 times pi divided by 2 pi. Now once again, this is some pretty simple math here because the pi is cancel out and we're just left with 4.0 divided by 2. Uh, so this is going to be a frequency of about, it's going to be a frequency of 2.0 hertz. And in case you're wondering why I'm not rounding this down to two sig to a single significant figure because of the two there, this is because uh, this is the actual formula for the frequency, and we're taking the two pi to refer to an exact value. As such, there is no uncertainty associated with the two pi value, so we're not counting this part towards significant figures. So it's just going to be 2.0 with two significant figures, and that is our frequency of the wave formula. Now, uh, part D asks us for the speed of the wave. Now this is going to be pretty simple since we have a very basic formula for the speed of the wave, and it's V uh, is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. Unfortunately for us, in the previous parts of the problem, we found both the wavelength in part B and the frequency in the previous part, part C. So we'll just have to multiply those two values together. So let's take uh, our wavelength, which was 100 centimeters, and we're multiplying that by the frequency, or 2.0 hertz. Right. And this is just going to be equal to 200 uh, centimeters per second. But I'll write this once again, just to be consistent, I'll write it in two significant figures. So this is going to be equal to uh, 2.0, so I'm writing this in scientific notation, so I can get it as two significant figures, times 10 to the power of 2 centimeters per second. All right. And that is our speed of the wave. Next part we want to find is uh, part E. We have to find the direction of the propagation of the wave. Okay, so this is pretty simple, because we know that the propagation of the wave is directed in the direction opposite to the sign on the angular frequency. That's why in the little skeleton formula we ha I have written here, there is a plus or minus symbol, because whether or not this is going to be plus or a minus is going to be directly relevant to the behavior of the wave. This is going to affect the behavior of the wave it's itself. And specifically, if this is a plus sign, then the wave is going to be propagating to the left in the negative direction. And if it's negative, then the wave will be propagating to the right in the positive direction. Now here, in the formula we're given for the wave, there's a plus symbol. The angular frequency is positive, meaning that our wave is going to be propagating in the negative x direction. Okay. Now for part F. Uh, part F is when things are going to be a little bit trickier. We are asked to find the maximum transverse speed of a particle in the string. Now what does that mean? You might think, well, didn't we already find the speed? We did that in part D. This is different, because this is asking us about the transverse speed. Now if you think about a wave, uh, a transverse wave, which is what we're specifically being asked about, which looks like a sinusoidal function, roughly like this, and you think about how that behaves. For example, imagine that this is a string oscillating with waves through this. Now, although the wave is propagating in a direction along the x-axis, in this case, in the negative x-direction, the transverse speed of a particle in the string 
refers to uh, the velocity at which um, a single individual particle on the actual string is, ignoring the direction of the wave itself. So for example, if we imagine, let's just arbitrarily choose a point right here on the string, and we're moving uh, at a wave, the, the string itself is stationary. Although a wave is moving through the string, the particles on the string themselves are only moving up and down along with uh, the particles, the other particles on the string. So if we pick out this particle arbitrarily right here, this particle is going to be moving up and down as the wave passes through it. That's a rather a rough explanation, but that should be a rough enough explanation that you can get the general idea of what's happening here and what exactly this question is asking us. So how are we going to find it, though? How are we going to find... Not only are we asked to find the transverse speed of the particle, we're asked to find what the maximum transverse speed of the particle on the string is going to be. Now, how are we going to find that? Well, keep in mind what this formula here is telling us. This formula we have right now is telling us uh, the transverse displacement, or the transverse position of a particle in the string at a given time. So, because this formula tells us the position of a transverse point on the wave, then uh, that means that if we take the derivative of this function here, we'll be able to find the speed. So, what we're going to do is, we want to get... Uh, an, a value for speed, and the the units for speed are always length per time. It's going to be some. It's always something like meters per second, or centimeters per hour, or kilometers uh, per day. Or, it, it, uh, speed is always going to be in a length uh, per time unit by dimensional analysis. So because we want uh, a, a value for speed with respect to time, then we will take the derivative of this with respect to the t value. Uh, and, th and that's an important detail, because if you don't understand what's going on here, then you might incorrectly try differentiating with respect to x or something. But uh, this is just a quick explanation as to why we're going to differentiate with respect to t. And we're going to be differentiating only with respect to t. So we're going to take a partial derivative here, rather than a total derivative. So let's take a partial derivative of y with respect to uh, t, meaning we're going to assume we're going to assume that all variables other than the t are constant. Uh, so before I do that, actually, let me quickly once more outline what exactly it is we're doing here. So if we have a formula y equals uh, the maximum, the amplitude, times the sine value of the angular wave number times k uh, plus the angular frequency times t, then the derivative of this is going to be uh, pretty simple. It's going to, if you've taken basic calculus, then this shouldn't be too tough. So the y sub m constant outside is going to remain the same, but the meat and potatoes of this formula is the sine function right here. Now, if you are familiar with the common derivatives, then you'll know that the derivative of a sine function is going to be equal to a cosine function. So the partial derivative of this becomes cosine of, and the phase inside the sine function remains the same. So it's going to be uh, kx plus uh, uh, omega t. And because we have a function inside the sine value here, uh, we are going to apply the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of the inside here. Now again, this is only a partial derivative, so we're going to ignore the uh, x variable here, even though that can change. So let's just treat kx as a constant and ignore it. Uh, so And the derivative of a constant is going to be 0. So we can just kind of ignore this part entirely. So then it becomes uh, omega times t. And the t is the variable we're differentiating with respect to. So this term is going to be important. So the derivative of a constant multiplied by the variable we're differentiating with respect to is just going to be equal to uh, the constant. Because if we apply the power rule, we'll see that this t will just completely disappear. So we are multiplying by the omega. So this means that uh, our, for our formula for the transverse speed of the wave is given by the amplitude times the cosine of the phase times the angular frequency. 
Now we have the formula for the speed of the wave, for the transverse speed of the particle in the string, rather. But we want to find the maximum transverse speed of a particle in the string. So we'll want to utilize a common calculus technique called maximizing the function, or minimizing the function. In this case, we want the maximum transverse speed, so we'll want to maximize this function. And how will we do that? Well, we'll want to focus on where the, the, the relevant variable here is. In this case, it's the t, the time variable. And we want to figure out how this function can be at its highest possible point. And actually, the fact that this is all within a cosine function actually makes our job pretty easy. Because, as you should know, a cosine or a sine function on its own can never be higher than 1 or lower than negative 1. So in other words, no matter what t is, no matter what any of this inside the phase is, the highest value that this cosine function can ever have on its own is going to be 1. So we can just take this whole cosine function and turn it into just 1 if we want the highest possible value that we can get from this function. So that means, uh, and I'll write this out as y uh, sub max, the maximum value of the transverse speed is just going to be equal to uh, the amplitude, y sub m, multiplied by 1, multiplied by the highest value of the cosine function, times the angular frequency, or the omega. And now we have a very simple formula we can use to find the maximum transverse speed of the wave. So let's just plug in our values, and uh, for the amplitude, we already determined in part a that it's going to be uh, 6.0 centimeters, multiplied by the angular frequency, which we determined earlier uh, to be uh, 4.0 pi radians per second. Actually, we didn't even determine that. The uh, formula up here gives us that because it's the constant associated with the t. So we're going to write that as uh, 4.0 pi radians per second. And uh, plugging this into our calculator, doing whatever we want to do, this gets us an answer of about, about 75 centimeters per second. Now this is going to be the maximum transverse speed of the wave. And for the, the final part of this problem, we're going to be, we're, we want to find the transverse displacement uh, at a point of x equals 3.5. Uh, centimeters, centimeters, and uh, where the time is equal to 0 0.26 seconds. So we will want to take our formula, or the formula we were given right off the bat for the transverse speed, or for the transverse displacement rather, and uh, find out what the transverse displacement will be at these values, and this will just very simply be a matter of plugging in the values given to us. Alright, so here I have written out the formula for the transverse displacement based on the values we're given. So here is the y with respect to uh, 3.5 centimeters for the x, and 0.26 uh, seconds for the time value. And as you can see here, I've simply plugged in those values where the x and the t would normally be, and, of course, plugging this into our calculator, doing a final calculation, uh, we get a transverse displacement of negative 2.0 uh, centimeters. That is our transverse displacement with those variables.